is everything I would have wanted as a kid, as a Dominican kid, um, is a box so that you could introduce Dominican books to your children as early as possible. Um, because I didn't think it was fair that I, at 22 years old, was, was discovering authors that I could relate to. Hey everybody, my name is George Torres and you're watching Siembra Sessions, where I host conversations intended to share stories of some of the artists, activists, game changers, and community builders that truly inspire me. The goal here is that we not only celebrate their journey as they're building their legacy, but that together we support them and amplify their work. Today's guest is an amazing trailblazing Dominicana who in 2015 decided to respond to feelings of being dismissed and displaced in literary spaces that she navigated. She founded and built a community intended to raise the profile of Dominican writers, the Dominican Writers Association. Four years later, she along with a dedicated board of advisors launched the very first Dominican Writers Conference in honor of Josefina Baez, a storyteller, educator, and thespian who work strives to make life more Dominicanish. That conference was a one-day event that made space in the community to help writers build their skills through carefully curated writing workshops and also clearly documented the state of Dominican literature by way of thought-provoking discussion panels. The pandemic has shifted how we live, learn, and play, but the Dominican Writers Association has not wavered. Their digital strategy has kept them more vibrant and more present than ever. Welcome, Angie Abreu. You said the word friend, and I was like, in my mind, I'm like, how long have I known George for? <laughs> it's been a really, really long time. Um, way before, like, going all the way back to probably the beginning of Capicu, right? Yes, Capicu, um, yes. That's that's where I've met, I, prob I probably could say I probably met every single Dominican writer in the association through Capicu at some point. Most likely, that's, yes. That's where they come to sell books. That's where they come to recite poetry. Yep. And all that. So thank you for joining us. If you're watching us on YouTube, on Twitter, uh, on Facebook, please, please, please share this out to everybody. Um, if you're watching this on the replay, we do appreciate it. We always want to make sure that our message is getting out to the masses, right? So let's start at the beginning. And I mean, the beginning, beginning. Talk to me about the first book you ever read. Oh, I don't think I remember that. that. What's, what's the what's the first memorable book? You know what? That is, I I read voraciously when I was a, a kid. So you know, I was a fan of the Babysitters Club and Goosebumps and Stephen King books and Nancy Drew, and you know, um, all those books I devoured. I spent a lot of time in the library. Um, and it was, you know, it was mainly because I was the only girl. I had two brothers. My brothers had themselves and I had books. So um, that those were my siblings, the books, right? Um, besides my obnoxious brothers back then. But um, I, I can't recall the first title that I read, but I do remember that books were a huge part of my growing up. All right. So it, it, since this conversation is all about representation, what was the first book that you felt seen in? It had to be one of Julia Alvarez's books. Okay. And and I read those in my 20s. Okay. So walk me through what that, that feels like to after reading so many titles where you're invisible, like there's nobody like you in those titles to actually read. Well, you know them. what? As a child, you really don't pay attention to those things, right? Um, you're just immersed in the storylines. You're not really paying attention to whether or not these characters look like you, especially because it's fiction, right? So these are made up stories. They're not gonna. I'm not gonna. Someone like me is not gonna be included in this. It's the the farthest thing from your mind. But um, it wasn't until my early twenties when I was taking a creative writing workshop. And I was writing stories that um, had these Dominican nuances um, that I realized that I had never read 
stories like that, right? So the fact that my professor was returning the stories to me and marking them up because she didn't understand what I was talking about when I was speaking of my Latinidad, my Dominicanidad, that's when I said, wait a minute, there has to be other people writing stories like I just wrote. I, it can't, I can't be the only one. And that's when I started my research and I found authors like Julia Alvarez and Angie Cruz and Juno Diaz. And I read, I went to the library and I read them all. And when I read, you know, how the Garcia girls lost their accent, to me, it was just like, wait, there's girls that came from DR just like I did? Girls who had an accent like I do? You know, girls who are trying to assimilate into this country like I am? That's when, you know, that resonated with me that that I was like, oh, wait, but definitely, there's definitely people out there writing our stories. Absolutely. So it, recently, I actually invested in a, um, in a publishing house that, that's geared towards disrupting the publishing space, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in their presentation, I found some numbers to be super alarming, and they probably were the numbers that actually made me want to have this conversation with you. Aside from the fact that we have to catch up, right? Because we haven't talked in a while. 79% um, of the publishing world is white. 89% mm -hmm. of it is straight or heterosexual. 99% of it is gender related. And Indeed. then 96% of it is non-disabled, right? Non-differently uh, abled. Mm -hmm. So those numbers are alarming. And even with as many yes. as, as we happen to know, that is still such a small percentage so talk yes, to me about is. talk to me. Well, part of your bio said that you know uh, you walk through certain literary spaces and felt dismissed. So talk to me a little bit about that. Like what 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 is the what what's the precursor to Dominican? So those literary spaces that I'm referring to are Dominican literary spaces. Oh wow! Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. And so yeah, so that. I I. Uh, I, I deal with with two issues when it comes to Dominican writers, and one of them is the older generation of Dominican authors, the one who um, live here, but their mind is in DR. Okay. And it's still amazing because these are people who are in their late 50s, 60s, 70s, who came here really early, um, and they never quite assimilated. And that boggles my mind, actually. Um, because they speak English, they have, they do, they, they work here, right? They live their life, th this American life, but their spirit, their mind is still in DR. And a lot of the stuff that they do is very rooted in the manner that, um, things are done in, in on the island. Um, so I have trouble bridging the gap between my generation and the older generation of writers because they're very conservative, they're very formal, and they feel that we should be writing a certain way or that if we have, they're very elitist as well, a lot of them. So, you know, I constantly have to battle it out in these spaces and, you know, and figure out a way for my generation and younger to be represented in these spaces. Because despite the fact that I'm Dominican American, how come you have a Dominican book fair, but we're not included? That, that must right? be very difficult to be in a situation where like, you're naturally inclined to like pay respect to the OGs and then the OGs just kind of disregard you, right? Yeah. So this year, for example, um, I, I went to the the people who were hosting the Dominican Book Fair and I stood. I went to this event. I had no idea it was going to be a press release because every, everything they announced is with reporters and it's this big, huge thing. And I had no idea there was going to be press there. But I showed up and they were announcing the book fair and I got really <laughs> pissed off. Because I'm just like, okay, here we go again. We're going to do this book fair. And again, we're dismissed. Right? So I stood up and I said, so when are you guys going to make that change? When are you going to include the Dominican American authors? Because many of us are out here writing. And we're the ones gaining the recognition. Right? Because Spanish writing authors 
are barely noticed in the US. But if you write in English, you get more notoriety. And yeah. you know, we have Elizabeth Acevedo and we have Angie Cruz and they're best-selling worldwide, world-known authors, Julia Alvarez, right? So when are when are these people going to get the recognition within the Spanish speaking Dominican community? Right? So those are the spaces where I felt dismissed, especially when um and I felt it a lot when I went to present my book at at an event that was for Dominican women writers and my book is in English. So when I read my passages in English, everyone is looking at me like I slapped them in the face. Wow. Right? So to me, it's just like, this is the language I move in. This is the language I live in. Yes, I speak, I speak and read Spanish, but I came here at five. So you know, you're and I'm, I'm, you're yeah, and I, I, I navigate my world in the English language. So of course, my book is in English. So why is that not acceptable? Why is that frowned upon? Right? So those are things that, that I deal with within our older generation, Dominican community of writers. And, and you know what's funny? When we were talking about having this conversation, we, we briefly had a chat about Encanto, right? Because that's a big conversation now, right? Representation in film. Uh, and And they talked about Colombian writers and and when I read the list of authors to you you were like no but uh, what happened with this one and that one and the other one and it seems like that's a common is a common problem I think in all the different Latino countries I think that we're all paying tribute to a lot of the older people and we're not highlighting the new people right well yeah Hi highlight them both yeah. you know um but I often a lot of people reach out to me and they usually send me, for example, I had someone reach out to me the other day and they were like, look, we're looking for Dominican poets. We are going to have this event for a women's month and we want to include Dominican women poets, right? So they send me the list and I was, and I re said, here we go again. Why are we still, you know, <laughs> and it's not, a, I, I don't want people to take it as disrespectful, right? But I also, in the same manner that we celebrate our writers such as Angie Cruz and Elizabeth, there's also a lot of other Dominican American writers who are doing big things and nobody talks about them. So talk I talk about, about them, Let's right? Talk about I, I talk about them and I tell and I remind people, hey, there's also this person that you be, you should be looking out for. There's also this poet who's in college and you should be looking out for the work that she's done, that she's doing because she's going to she's going to go places, right? So it's not only mention Angie and Elizabeth and Julia, mention everyone else as well that's up and coming. Do your research. These are not the only authors. In the same manner that at some point everyone said, oh, Juno is the representation of the Dominican American writers. No, there's a whole bunch of us. I have a list of more than a hundred. I keep a list. I track Dominican authors, right? So I know that there's a lot of us. I track our books. I track our publishing rate. There's a lot of us. And we need to be talking about them. So let's talk a little bit about the business of Dominican Writers Association. What are some of the services? What are some of the, the resources that you make available for Dominican writers to help them with their craft? So writing workshops of course um we have guest facilitators we also have people who volunteer to host workshops we have um a group of about 50 writers that i mentor um and that i teach or i also teach them how to mentor others so once what's happened is that they learn from me and then they pay it forward right so i share all my information and resources i am totally against gatekeeping I don't gain anything by not sharing information. I give all my information away um, because my biggest joy is to see the next writer blow up. Absolutely. When you make it big, that's my biggest joy. And that's why you're right? here. So I, that's when I share 
I share all that information. And now, you know, the OGs, what we call them, um, are now passing along that information. I, and I train these writers to teach workshops. I train them on pu publishing, right? I give them this information like you did about publishing being so white and, you know, um, letting them know what they, sh they should be looking out for. Because I do have so many writers that come up to me disappointed because they submitted a query letter to a literary agent and that literary agent responded with, I don't even know what to do with this. <laughs> or I don't have the bandwidth. And that and means, that basically means that your book is probably very Latino and they're white and they have no idea how to market your book to the Latino community. Absolutely. And, and when we have a I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, what I was going to say is that, you know, most publishers don't want a very Latino book. They want a book that's relatable universally. Yeah, makes right? sense. Right? So, because that's how they're going to make their money. They want everyone to relate to it. But yeah. guess what? We don't, we Latinos don't write for white people. We could care less. We don't. We don't write for you. We write for our community. Yeah. And I don't think that's clicked with the publishing industry. And that's and that's going to be my next point. My next point is that when we have conversations about In the Heights, the movie and West Side Story, and we have conversations about Encanto and all these other movie projects that are coming out, I don't think people realize that the lack of representation might be due to the fact that our writers aren't getting enough shine because the writers is where it all starts. Right. right. They're, they're not being allowed in the writer's room. They're not, they're, not, they're not allowed in the writer's room. They're not allowed in places where decisions are made. Some, some people are not producing uh, or they're not bringing these stories to the table to pitch them. Um, so they, they, you're taking care of a root cause. Like by you having the Dominican Writers Association and this conference, you're actually addressing a root cause of everything that we've been talking about for the last couple of months on social. It's been crazy. During the pandemic, the conversation about Latino representation has gone nuts. You know, we just had the conversation last week about how Hentify was canceled. Yes, that hurt me so bad. Well, uh, one day at a time, you know, yeah. like these are really good shows and we're loving them. There was, a, there was another show that I, I enjoyed that it was The Baker and the, oh my God, it was set in Miami. Okay, It maybe was about this, this guy whose family had a bakery in Miami. I for, oh my God, I felt, I saw it on Netflix and I fell in love with it. And I was texting my, my friends and I was like, why did this get canceled? <laughs> why, why are these great Latino shows getting canceled? Yep, and, and I think it's, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a multi-layered problem, but I think that what you're doing is going to be pivotal in making sure that we have some access in the future to better projects. Because if these stories are told, and these books are published and these authors blow up, eventually companies are going to start seeing that and they're going to start investing in those projects. Now, yeah. well, ho thankfully now we see, we see more. Story, right? Thankfully now we see more and more Latino authors being published. And I'm so happy about that. You know, when, when I did my research in 2015, not in 2015, when I was in college in my early twenties, I only found, for Dominican American authors. And now I have a list of more than a hundred. So, you know, we're out there, we're, we're getting published. We are it, not a, as at the fast rate that we wish we had, you know, um, but it, 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 the list is definitely growing for Latino authors, for Dominican American authors. And I, I love seeing, seeing our books. What's one of the biggest surprises? Like, you know, obviously when you're building something that doesn't exist, right? There's no, there's no, there's, there's, you don't have a model. Like you're not really doing this and saying to yourself, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, model myself after this other organization. Yeah. So as you're building it, what are some of the things that really surprised you about this journey? Like that really kind of get a chocado, you know, like either either visibly or or like personally when you go home at the end of the night like what what are some of the biggest highlights so george you know what um i i think that prior to dominican writers i was 
getting the preparation that I needed to run such a platform. Because as you know, I had my our own my own poetry collective, right? Um, where we I had open mics, was hosting open mics in my apartment, and then later we were hosting them in venues here in Uptown Manhattan in the same manner that you guys were hosting Capicu. Um, so I was already doing like the event planning aspect of that, right? And then there was, you know, hosting writing workshops that people would invite me to host writing workshops at Word Up Bookstore. Um, we did them for high schools as well. So all those years before Dominican writers, unconsciously, without my knowing, I was already getting the skills and preparation I needed without knowing that Dominican, that I was going to create Dominican writers and that it was gonna be what it is today. And I tell people all the time, I never had the vision of Dominican writers being what it was, what it is today. I never did. I have to be honest with you. Dominican writers was simply going to be a bookstagram account before I even knew what bookstagram is, right? Um, I just wanted to share Dominican books and Dominican, um, and, and Dominican book information, right? If you scroll all the way down to our first post on Instagram, I asked people tag a Dominican writer. That was our first post because I wanted to, I wanted them to reveal themselves. And I also was trying to figure out who out there was really interested in our, in our books, right? So. As, as the years have progressed, I've, I listen a lot to our audience and, and what their needs are. Um, and I've been able to provide them with those things, right? They've, they wanted writing workshop. I could do that. I've hosted writing workshops. I could book people. I do that, you know, with the snap of an eye. I have such a huge network, thankfully, of wonderful creative people who have never said no to me. Um, thankfully, right? And I guess it's because I don't know. I guess it's because I've also don't say no to them is a is a give and take. Um, so I'm able to pull those resources that I have and offer them to the to our platform. And if there's anything they need, I figure it out. I figure out how to offer it. During the pandemic, we had a series where we interviewed publishing. Um, industry folks, ask these literary agents your questions. At, look, um, here's an illustrator of books. Here's um, an editor, right? Um, these are people that you should be knowing and you should be talking about. These are the Latino people behind the scenes who are making sure our books are getting out there. So I, I also think of what would I want to know as a writer? Right, I, I don't write anymore. I don't have the time to write anymore. The Running the platform is my biggest passion. So it's no longer my writing. Um, and I'm always, you know, trying to figure out what is it that our writers need? What kind of information do they want? What are they looking for? Um, and, I'm, and I make myself available to offer them that information. So I'm constantly learning, right? And researching, I don't know everything. The publishing industry is ever changing, <laughs> you know, um, and I need to be informed of these things so that I could pass that information down to the author who wishes to publish themselves, whether it is traditionally or as self-published. So are you also creating lists of like editors and graphic designers? Yes, I do. People that I have it. Yep. So you have it, I have huh? a, I have a list of editors. I have a list of uh probably a hundred and something illustrators um, oh, wow. and graphic designers. So these are resources that when somebody consults me, I give it to them. Um, and they and this is a list that is constantly being updated. So they could also go in there. It also includes information that you as a writer should know. So for example, that information about publishing so white, every writer who wants to publish should know the publishing industry so that they're not disappointed <laughs> when they get certain responses. They need to know what's going on there. I, I never advise a writer to go in the, into it blindly. If you're looking for a literary agent, please know that most of them are white and most of them are not going to know what to do with your Latino stories. So we have a question from the audience. Papo Santiago, you may know him from uh, 
from a cool little project called Capi Cool in Brooklyn. Hey, Papo. He wants to know, as a writer uh, and becoming the platform keeper, do you miss being known for your own writing? Is that part of you? I don't, think, I don't think I was ever known for my, my writing. <laughs> you know, I, I self-published a, a little poetry book and, you know, that was it. That was something I, I wanted to get out of, out of my system. But yeah, I don't think, I don't think if, if you ever ask anyone, hey, do you know Angie? I don't think writer is ever going to be the description. Hmm. Okay. It's probably going to be, oh, the founder of Dominican Writers, or oh, the, they're probably mentioned the Poetry Collective, or word, or maybe associate me to Word Up, or or something like that. But I don't think writer would be it, Papo. So, obviously, the the pandemic changed the way we live, right? And Definitely. Uh, for many of us that have depended on live events such as conferences and open mics and, and book expos, et cetera, um, we found ourselves at a loss, right? Because everything stopped. But I feel now Dominican writers has become bigger and stronger as a result of the pandemic. Is that factual? Is that fact? Or like, like what is the pan what, what kind of opportunities has the pandemic opened for Dominican writers? I tell people that the pandemic was a blessing for our platform. Um, because we went digital, everything is now virtual and it opened up the platform to people all over the world. So, you know, whereas our, most of our events and writing workshops were in person and were only attended by people who were local to New York city. Now our writing workshops can be attended from people in California, from Texas. We have a writer that attends our writing workshops and she's in Italy. Right. Wow. We have people in London. We have people all over the place. We have people that beg us not to go back to in-person workshops. Um, you know, even our, our book clubs, they ask us, you know, I hope that you continue doing this virtually because it's been a tremendous um, help for me or, you know, or they really enjoy the, the virtual um, events of it. So it, 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 the pandemic definitely opened us up to the world. Um, and also because we, I myself made it a point to, I guess in a way I, was, I felt responsible to our audience and providing them a safe space to, you know, to just let go of all the anxiety and their depression and everything that they were dealing with during the pandemic. I myself had was dealing with a lot of anxiety um, last summer, for example. And I know a lot of our audience members felt like that too. And being in community and being in a space that, of people who are embracing you and who are there for you is of great help. So that that was one of my one of my biggest things also when going virtual. So now when it comes to books, right, we have to create the next generation of readers. And I noticed that in watching your content on, on Instagram and, and on Facebook, you've been promoting a lot of kids books. Like talk to me a little bit about some of the like authors that are actually like hooking the kids on books nowadays and, and the companies. And the people in the community that support them, such as like Bronx Bound Books, uh, you know, uh, the, the, Lip the Lip Bar, Bar Word Up, this, Mil Mundo, you know, Cafe Con Libros. There yeah. you go. Like they, they, there's, there's a support system within New York anyway. Uh, there's a support yeah. system to make sure that the kids get these books. So talk to me about some of those authors yeah. and what kind so, of topics are you broaching? So besides Dominican writers, we created Little Dominican Readers. And Little Dominican Readers was a book box idea I had a few years ago. Um, and the book box is, uh, is not a subscription box, but it's a box of Dominican books. And I had been trying for the last five years to figure out how to launch this box. Um, I had looked up all the description stuff and everything. And I'm like, damn, there's a lot of work. <laughs> I'm like, I don't think I have the bandwidth to, to handle this, but I knew that it was something that I wanted to launch. And, um, Mariela, who was part of our team, her cousin is the, um, co-founder of Onekin. 
and one kin is a uh, is a uh, how do I do this? So I don't want to be so I don't want to disrespect Jennifer um, and her platform, but it's it's like a, a shop, an online shop for small black owned businesses, right? So that um, so that those people who were affected by the pandemic can now have a space to sh- to who didn't have a storefront can now have a space to sell their items. So right? it's like so a digital you, mall. Yes. Yeah, so if you go to onekin.co, you will see so many beautiful items there from jewelry to, you know, to lotions and whatnot. And I had one meeting with Jennifer and we came up with little Dominican readers. And this box is very special and dear to my heart because um God, I'm gonna get emotional. <laughs> it's um, it's everything I would have wanted as a kid, as a Dominican kid. Um, is a box so that you could introduce Dominican books to your children as early as possible. Um, because I didn't think it was fair that I, at 22 years old, was was discovering authors that I could relate to. And I wanted to change that with the with the box. That would that was I'm sorry. No, I didn't no. know I was gonna this is the first time I cry about this, but um so I wanted to change that with the box. So partnering up with Jennifer and and having her company help me fulfill these boxes was has been, you know, one of one of my biggest dreams because now parents can gift these boxes to their children and introduce books to their kids, Dominican books where they see themselves, right? Bilingual books um, that their parents can read to them as early as possible. Um, so out of you know, because we had little Dominican readers is also an Instagram page where where I share these Dominican books as well, because we always have parents asking us, what are the Dominican books out there for my kids? I want to know what they should be reading, what I could introduce them to. What are what are these books? And um, these are the books that I share with them. And you're in the business of promoting authors. So let's talk about some of those authors. What what kind of topics oh. are they- when it comes to Dominican children's books, what what topics are being discussed? We have we have topics about hair. We have topics on autism, you know, um, travel, um, and you know, keeping the environment safe. We also have fiction books, um, all kinds of all kinds of topics and stories that you know. And I always encourage people. When they ask me, hey, has anyone written a book about this? And I tell them, no, not yet, but that person could be you. Right? Um, Write that book, write that book that you can't find. Right? That that's what we should be doing. Fill those spaces that haven't been filled yet, because our stories do matter. Um, and not not everyone's story is the same. You and I could have the same experience, but our our perspective of it and and how we live that experience is very different. It's never going to be the same. So I encourage and motivate our writers to and tell them, hey, I could give you all the information you need so that you too can write that story. Yep, and it's it's important because we want our kids to be the best, right? But it's hard for them to be something that they can't see. So, yeah. so that's that's really just really key. So let's drop some names. Let's drop some names. Let's talk about some authors here. Who are some of the authors that that really stand out to you? In every genre. Yeah, just give me you know like a quick. No, Look, we don't want to, um, we don't want to get in trouble because I know there's so many names. But just give me like one in each. Yes, category. yes. Look, currently one of the authors that I mention a lot is Adriana Herrera. If you like, um, if you like um, Daniel Steele and and like books like The Notebook and romance novels, 
Uh, Adriana Herrera is a romance novel author. She puts out about 10 books a, a year. She's una loca. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I call her. She publishes with Harlequin and she also publishes, self-publishes her books, but her, her books include um, a Dominican protagonist in a romance, you know, scenery. So yeah, maybe I've lived the Dominican romance story 10 times in my life, <laughs> but maybe you want to read <laughs> about a Dominican falling in love, right? Um, so there's that, there's Adriana Herrera, there's, you know, Julian Randall, who is publishing his first YA novel um, that's coming up and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, there's um, Alejandro Hereda, who wrote a collection of stories about friendship. It is such a beautiful, beautiful collection of, um, of stories. Um, who else? Oh my God, there's just so many, so many authors. What about, what about people who are like thespians, people like, like Josefina Baez? What about comic book artists, like uh, comic book writers? What about screenplay writers? Like, are, are there, do you have a diverse, like community of so, writers so writers. even though we do speak about these authors our focus on the platform is mostly writers who write fiction poetry and creative nonfiction. okay though because and i say that because it's the space that i'm mostly aware of right um script writing is a whole other scene um, writing for film, writing, you know, playwrights, theater is a whole different ball game. Things work very differently in those spaces. And I, and those are not my spaces, right? Um, because I myself was a poetry writer, th I'm, the space that I'm more knowledgeable on is fiction, poetry, creative nonfiction, children's books. What do you think the solution to the publishing bias or or structure is like what what is what's ultimately the, the the solution is it getting them to publish us is it us creating our own publishing houses is it self-publishing like like what what is it ultimately for you look i'm at the point that i'm gonna do like jay-z and beyonce and and boycott the grammys right like latino authors should boycott the the publishing industry <laughs> and create our own spaces with, you know, create these, you know, Latino owned publishing houses, right? Um, because it's unfortunate if the publishing industry is not gonna change that fast. The report that you read to me, the last one was done about four years ago and the difference was three points. So yeah, so there's no there's no growth for Latinos right now in 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 publishing, and and I have no idea what. It, well, yeah, I do have an idea. It's the pay. One one of the factors is the pay. Um, publishing pays very poorly, and it is a uh, industry where um, employees are overworked. And okay. as you know, us Latinos growing up our responsibilities and are very different than white folks. Yeah. Right. I, I was telling someone the other day, just earlier today that I've been working since I was 14, you know, and since I was 14, I've been helping my mom financially. Right. So there's certain things that I cannot afford to do if I want to continue helping my family. And that is taking a minimum wage job, right? Um, but definitely, I wish that, you know, little, not little by little, but a little bit faster <laughs> than how it's been moving, that publishing would start hiring more and more um, Latino and, and just, not just Latinos, but a more diverse staff. Correct, um, yeah because there should be a latino or, or diverse staff along every publishing process from the marketing to the acquisition to the literary agent everything if a literary just doesn't understand something they should have someone on their staff that should break it down to them 
So, and they so should any- accept who we are, you know, and not invalidate our stories because that's another thing that also happens. When we write our stories, it's, we don't have an audience with it, but let it be a white woman from middle America who writes our Latino stories, then she gets a six figure contract. Mm-hmm. And we, I'm not even going to mention the book. I, 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 okay. I <laughs> so, okay. And so th- what, things definitely need to change. What would it take, Angie? Uh, and, and are you even the person for this, right? But what would it take for you to start knocking on doors and telling the publishing houses, let me show you the way. Let me show you, let, like, let me bring in my, my, my folks, right? Let me show you what they could do. Let me show you the potential. Maybe training literary agents, like training them on, on how to, to, to look for different types of talent. Uh, maybe maybe you do consulting gigs where you help book companies market. Like you have a very I, wide talent base, right? Like you you, you I, learn. I don't think I'm I don't think I'm there yet, but I'm I'm hoping to be there soon. Okay. Um, because one of the visions that I have for this platform is to be sort of like um the godparent, right? Of all these Dominican American authors. Um I want publishing houses to tap us and say, hey, we we need you. And we have had that happen. We've had that happen. You know, um, last year we did we did the media tour for Dominicana of Angie Cruz. We did it in DR. We we had um Angie Cruz and and Kiani Antigua, who was a translator of Dominicana, the first translator, the first time that a Dominican person translates a Dominican novel in the entire United States. Could you believe that? Wow. So you're seeing a lot right? of first. So so this is stuff that if it wasn't because of me and and Angie Cruz and Veronica from Word Up, there this wasn't gonna happen. But behind the scenes, we had we had a challenge and we were meeting that challenge and we didn't let go. We we persisted that this book needed to be translated by a Dominican person because we were dead tired of having our books translated by people who don't speak Dominican. And yes, there is a Dominican language. Yes, There's a Dominican language. There absolutely. Okay, is. in the same way that you go to Puerto Rico and you and you go to Lo Barrio, there's we speak differently. Yes. Hondurians speak differently. Panamanians speak different. Colombians, Venezolano, we all speak a different type of Spanish. Spain speaks a different type of Spanish. So don't send my Dominican book to Chile to be translated by a Chilean author. Why? I'm laughing, I'm laughing but I know, I know that that's the case, right? Our, you Chilean, know, but... Continue. but but yeah, that was one of the things that we accomplished last year, having that Dominicana by Angie Cruz translated by by a Dominican author. And you know, the other day I was uh, um, I was telling Elizabeth Acevedo that we need Clap When You Land translated, you know? And she's like, oh my God, I didn't think of that. And I was like, but we are, and we're gonna get on it, right? Because we, we need that book translated to Dominican Spanish as well. Um, so going back to what you you were asking, we do have publishing houses that that reach out to us, like Penguin and Flatiron. They do reach out to us, and also the authors that get their um, contracts, they make sure that the publishing houses know about us and they engage us. Right? They send an email and they tell their publisher, "I just want you to know." that the Dominican Writers Association is here to help us. Wow. So, so you know, so I appreciate that. And they do it before their book comes out. They, there's like an email connection and, you know, it's it's in my on my radar. And I appreciate that very much because it, it lets me know that what we're doing to help them is definitely worth it, right? Um, I had a writer the other day that was writing uh, his, his proposal um to a literary agent and he's like look they were asking me about the marketing and promotion they asked him about the marketing and promotion because his book is dominican 
How about I ask you? You're my publisher. <laughs> you're, what do you mean? You're asking you me? For that? <laughs> right? Let, right. Don't you have an entire team? So I said, you know what? Don't worry about it. Just send it to me and I write, I'll write out the language for you. And I tell people all the time, look, when, when literary agents tell you that you don't have a marketing and promotion team, tell them you have Dominican writers. Grandpa. Tell them we tell them we out here, you know, and if they want to tell you to say that you don't have the following, because now if you're not very, um, you know, if, if you're not very active on social media or whatnot, that's also looked down upon. Right. And I'm like, OK, our platform has 20,000 followers. So, you know, let them let them know we're here. We are uh-huh. here to help you. And a lot of this, you know, and often I do the work for free just because I want to see you get in there. Because I know that once our authors get in there, once our translators get in there, the work rains on them. Yeah. And that's how, th- that's what's happened. So Angie, I don't want to end this conversation without a very strong call to action. Because I feel like where you're at right now, the momentum that the pandemic has provided you, the success stories that you have under your, you know, on your, on your, on the table right now, people need to know how they could help you. Cause it's not just sharing a post on Instagram. It's not like there's actionables that people could take to really support you in a meaningful way that, that will actually help you help the authors, the translators, the editors, everybody in the, in the whole chain of, uh, of, of, of life, right. Of, of Dominican literary, uh, literature. Talk about that. So tell me, how can people help you help them? Talk about us. Share us with other people. Um, I get such beautiful messages from people, you know, who find our platform, right? And they're like, oh, my God, I had no idea you existed. I had no idea there were so many of us. Thank you for sharing these stories. Thank you for hosting this book book club event. I I feel like I found my tribe, right? Because there's nothing like it. I mean, Latino community, there's nothing like it. You know, whether you're from from different Latino country, once you find your people and you speak in Spanish, it's a it's una familia, right? It's a camaraderie. It's a you know, it, it's it's something very magical, and it's it's also one of the reasons why I have refused to host our conference virtually because when we met in person and it was more than 300 of 300 of us at city college at the conference that was a magical day and there's no way that that magic can be transmitted via screen so for all of you that keep asking me i will not host this conference on zoom (laughs) i refuse but a way, you know, another way to help us besides sharing is donate. Um, we are a 50C, a 501c3 nonprofit. A lot of our work is based on grants. I am a grants manager by day. Dominican Writers is not my full-time job. It is, but is but I also have a nine to five and I am a grants manager. So I have the skills of applying for grants. Um, and that's how we've been sustaining the platform. We also have beautiful people in our community that bless us all the time. Um, I have received gift grants from people that I have who've been impacted by the platform and say, hey, my company was giving out this grant and I decided, you know, to apply on your behalf. Here's the money. And to me, that's just like, oh, my God, we only spoke once. (laughs) but they follow the platform and they've been impacted by the work that we do and they feel compelled to, to make these gifts to us. So, you know, there's that, there's the, the donations, they're sharing our info there there's, and most definitely purchasing a Dominican book and, and sharing it and reviewing it. And then reviews are so important. It brings us more visibility. It lets the publishers know that we're out there reading, um, a lot, unfortunately, publishers feel that Latinos don't read. But guess what? All these Latino books that are that are going bestsellers, it's us Latinos most of mostly buying them. Absolutely, it's, it's not white people. Absolutely. It's mostly us. 
that are bringing them to, you know, the notor notoriety that they have. And I, I so just want share, donate, and reshare again. Keep sharing, right? Tell, tell, I always say, tell, tell a friend to tell a friend to tell their primos, right? That's for sure. Yes, um, exactly. I, I also want to extend an invitation to all the Dominican writers in your community to submit to Sofrito for Your Soul. Because we do have a platform that's already there. It's 25 years old this year. Um, so we've been out here doing this work and whatever. And I, I've i never had a partnership with writers that was extremely, that I felt really good about. And I know you and I have been discussing how we're going to, you know, how we're going to complement each other. And I, I just want to make sure that the authors know that it's not just them submitting and 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 us promoting their books and whatever. I have tools and resources that I want to make available to them to help them with their promotion, to help them with their visibility online. Um, so so stay tuned for more announcements in that direction. Um, but uh, at the very end of this, uh, this conversation, we'll have a, a, a little trailer that will tell you what exactly we're looking for in terms of submissions. So Angie, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate your time. I know that, that you know, it's during the week and there's a ton of things that you could be doing, but I appreciate you coming out here and sharing your story to inspire other people to create that thank thing that's passionately inside of them, right? Um, thank you. About that problem that 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 keeps them up at night. Um, Did we yeah. answer all the questions? Yeah, we answered all the questions I that came through. I don't want to be rude. <laughs> no, no, we answered all the questions that came through in the chat. Um, I will let people know that, you know, obviously this is going to be available on replay. It's going to be available on YouTube, on Facebook. I'm going to try to get it on Instagram for those people who are just hardcore Instagram folks. Um, it'll be available to everybody. Um, and ask questions in the comment section of those replays, because I'm I'm pretty sure that me and Angie are going to be paying attention to the to the feedback and we will definitely be in there to answer questions and and definitely and yes resources. Angie, before you go, tell people how to find you online. Definitely. So on all social media platforms, it's Dominican Writers on Instagram, Facebook. Our website is DominicanWriters.com. Um, if you're a writer, definitely go to the Writers tab on our website and you'll see tons of information and resources from writing workshops and to other informational um, stuff that you should know. Um, and there's also all the other book events that we host and, you know, we, I try to keep up with our Instagram page as much as possible. Subscribe to our newsletter. We have a, if you're looking for a writing community, um, Sundays, we host a writing workshop through the entire year. Every Sunday at 11 AM It's called the Sunday writing salon. Um, and it's a beautiful Latino, mostly Latino writing writers community. So if you if you ever in a slump, it's for emerging writers. You don't need to be a pro. Come through and you know write with us. Absolutely, thank you so much, Angie. I hope that thank this is you, the George. last time that we chat online. No, uh, definitely. <laughs> but um, but yeah, but just thank you for everything that you do. And folks, support this lady. All right, she's pouring her heart and soul into her people into the community, into our legacy, to make sure that people in the future know what our lived experience has been in this country, in, in, in the passage from our country to this country, and everything in between. So thank you so much. All right? Thank Here's you, George. Video I told you about. Thank you Have so much. Have a good night, everybody. Bye, everybody.